Hello, everybody. Welcome to Old News, the museum's webcast, bringing you new discoveries from the field of paleontology. We are so excited that you're able to join us today, even though we are connecting with you guys from our home to yours. My name is Laura Beth, and I am the Outreach Specialist at the museum. I'll be your host for today, so go ahead and type in your questions into the live chat, and I'll be looking at those and making sure that we get some answers. So I have a special guest with me today, and some of you may know him really well, but some of you might be new to old news, and you might not know him very well. So I have the museum's research curator of paleontology, Dr. Christian Kammerer. He is a Hello, triceratops Laura. lover. Hey, Christian, how are you doing today? Hi. <laughs> Hi. I'm doing well. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here to translate you know, these research papers for us and share the news, right? And we are all so excited. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. There are you know, still fascinating discoveries in paleontology coming out weekly now. Um, and yeah, I think we have some, some very cool stuff to talk about this month. Awesome, so what are we learning about today? Well, today we're gonna be talking about the crazy beast um, which is a new mammal uh, that has recently been discovered. Uh, it's a type of animal called a Gondwana theer, and that's probably not a group that is familiar to most people. So we need to step back a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, step back a bit and explain what a Gondwana theer is. Uh, and to do that, first, we should talk about what Gondwana as a concept is. Um, so, Laura Beth, you uh, probably are familiar with Pangea. Yes, I've heard of Pangea. Yeah, the one. Yeah, the, the, the supercontinent. Yeah, the right? one supercontinent um, right. from long ago, from uh, over 200 million years ago, when all the continents were basically one. Um, so the continents, they uh, are on top and are composed of these tectonic plates that make up the Earth's crust and they move around through time by what's called plate tectonics. So currently we have a, you know, what seems like a static arrangement of the continents, uh, but this is actually a very recent event in Earth history. If you go back even a few million years, the continents start to be in different places. And if you go back a long time, like say to the Mesozoic era, the age of dinosaurs, things would look very different from they are today. So if we, let's go all the way back uh, initially to the Triassic, one of my favorite periods, and bring up a, I'll bring up a map here. So this is Pangea during the Triassic. Um, and you can, can see- Can you remind that, me, sorry, how many years ago this would be? This so point? this would be a, between 200 and 250 million years ago, uh, this arrangement. And so it is, it's one land mass, but it can be broken down into basically these two large sections of it. So Pangea um, has this northern group uh, called Laurasia, and then this southern block uh, called Gondwana. So Gondwana is, is the southern set of continents. Um, and this rough north-south split continues to the present day. So the Laurasian uh, landmass is what became North America, Europe, and Asia. And the Gondwanan landmass is what became South America, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. Um, and, you know, obviously there were animals living all across Pangaea. So both Laurasia and Gondwana full of extinct animals um, throughout the age of dinosaurs. Uh, but we have a much better knowledge uh, as paleontologists, basically of Laurasian animals than Gondwanan animals. Uh, the reasons for that are their manifold. A lot of it has to do with sort of socio-political history and the legacy of imperialism and things like that. Um, but for all those reasons, uh, there's a lot of work done on Laurasian fossils and until recently, relatively little on Gondwanan. So looking at a map of the world today. You know, we know tons of things about the dinosaurs here in the United States and in Europe and increasingly in places like China. Um, 
but the dinosaurs from South America, from Africa, really just in the past 50 years or so, have we started to get a good understanding of what those faunas were like. Um, and much like the world nowadays, uh, different animals lived in different parts of the world in the age of dinosaurs. So we shouldn't expect to see just like all the same fossils that we're familiar with in the Northern hemisphere living in the Southern hemisphere. And that has indeed like proven to be the case uh, and some very like new and interesting groups, um, entire lineages of animals have shown up in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, some of which seem to be specific to you know, certain regions. Um, this is what is called endemism. It's when a group of animals is only found in one place. Uh, a classic example would be like, you know, the marsupials in Australia nowadays, um, or the animals on the island of Madagascar. Uh, and let me just highlight Madagascar on the map here off the east coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. Um, so it has its own unique fauna. Uh, Laura Beth, you know any, any great Ma Malagasy animals? Yes, yeah, actually one of my favorites um, to program with here at the museum is our Madagascar hissing cockroaches. They are not found anywhere else in the world. So yeah, we call them endemic to Madagascar. Yeah, indeed. So like Madagascar hissing cockroaches, uh, Tenrex, which I think are also in the, at the museum. Yes. Um, yeah. And then of course, things like the lemurs, uh, things like the, the fuchsia, these large mongoose-like predators, uh, a whole diverse array of chameleons and different groups of birds like ground rollers and mesites. Um, Madagascar has this super rich fauna of animals that is nowadays is known nowhere else on earth. Um, and the same is true if you look in deep time. And it turns out, uh, even though like in most maps, you'll see Madagascar in the map for Africa, geologically, it's actually quite distinct and is called sort of a an island continent or like a, a subcontinent by some. And if you look, so we showed the Triassic earlier, if you go a little more recently to the end of the age of dinosaurs, to, let's go to the Cretaceous period. This is when like T-Rex, Triceratops, uh, duckbills, all those animals would have been living. Um, you can see Pangaea has started to break up and you're getting an arrangement, not quite like the modern age, but more more similar, you can start to see, okay, that's North America, that's South America. And the interesting thing about Madagascar is it is, even by the Cretaceous, it is not attached to Africa. It's probably been detached from Africa, if we point out Madagascar right there, for maybe as much as 170 million years. Um, what's happening, yeah, in the Cretaceous is that you can see it's attached to this large triangular landmass. Um, and so that triangular landmass is actually India. Um, the Indian subcontinent. So nowadays, India is part of Asia, but it is geologically, it was originally part of Gondwana. And so what happened is it detached from Africa and Antarctica, and then basically it sort of like floated via plate tectonics through the Indian Ocean until it crash landed into Asia. And that, that crash basically is what threw up the Himalayan mountains. Um, through, you know, th this was a very slow event that took millions and millions of years, but it was massive force creating, you know, the world's tallest mountain range. So That's you've got Madagascar. That's origin story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, a little side jaunt into some uh, mountain building there. Uh, but Madagascar and India were an island continent for much of the Cretaceous. And then by the end of the Cretaceous, they had even pulled it apart. So Madagascar has been an island unto itself for, you know, maybe more than 70 million years. And in, if you look to the end of the age of dinosaurs, so you would expect to see some endemic animals there even by that time, uh, because it's isolated from all the other continents. And recently there has been increased attention from paleontologists to Madagascar. Uh, and there are some like very rich fossil bearing exposures. So um, one team working in the late Cretaceous, almost like the latest Cretaceous, has found a lot of interesting dinosaurs and other animals. So we can look at this animal here, Majungasaurus. So these are all Reminds fossils that have been found in. Yeah, so very, would have been very similar ecologically. So this is a member of the group called the Abilosaurs. Uh, Abilosaurs were sort of like the Tyrannosaurus of the Southern Hemisphere. They're not at all related. 
Um, well, you know, they're, they're dinosaurs, they're theropod dinosaurs, but they're not, right. they're not close relatives. Um, but so they this were would be another, I'm sorry, this would be another no, go, example go of convergent evolution, right? Yes. Yeah. So those of you uh, who are not new to old news, I, almost every episode, I feel like we have another example of convergent evolution. I love it. Yeah. I, well, it's, it's a pervasive feature of the history of life on earth. Um, and yeah, so the abelosaurs, they were top predators in their environments. Uh, tyrannosaurs, as far as we know, were not living in these environments. Um, and they're even convergent in the sense of like T-Rex itself and other tyrannosaurids in that they greatly reduced the arms. So you look at Majungasaurus mm -hmm. there has tiny little arms. Right. And a close, a close relative of Majungasaurus from South America, uh, maybe a more famous animal called Carnotaurus, which is a dinosaur, uh, looks like this, but it has big horns over the eyes. It had even more reduced arms, like it barely even had arms at all. Like the fingers basically are popping right off of uh, the main arm bone in that animal. So strange animals, uh, very like rugose skulls. Um, but this animal, Majungasaurus, is only, only known from Madagascar. Uh, so the dinosaurs there are unique. It also has a, a very unique um, crocodile fauna. So if you look, this is an animal called Simosuchus. <laughs> it's a member of the group called uh, Notosuchian crocodiles. These are, uh, this one is very strange. It was a plant-eating crocodile. So we think it, it wouldn't have been a predator like modern crocs. Uh, very short tail, almost dog-like proportions to this thing. Um, and this remarkably short skull, this blunt skull. And so the name Simosuchus means uh, basically the pug crocodile or the nosed crocodile. Um, and it would have been, you know, quite small too. This animal would have been around the size of a living dog. So yeah, Simosuchus maybe would have made a, made a good pet. Um, but it's, it's totally bizarre. <laughs> it like it couldn't run very fast. Yeah, they would have been quite slow moving um, <laughs> compared to like a modern alligator or a crocodile. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's unique dinosaurs, unique other reptiles, uh, but maybe like in my mind, the most exciting discoveries to come out of uh, the late Cretaceous of Madagascar has been mammal fossils. Um, of so mammals are, you know, I won't say poorly known anymore in the Mesozoic era, but certainly are more poorly represented in the fossil record than things like dinosaurs. Uh, they're right. mostly known from very fragmentary remains, mostly just teeth. Um, there are a few exceptional sort of complete mammals, but most of them are just like itty bits of teeth. Mm -hmm. and, Which we can learn a lot from, but it's not yeah. ideal. Oh, no. There's, right. a, there's a huge amount of data to be pulled from the dental record. Uh, but it's also, you know, it it's, makes them very mysterious in some ways. Uh, like we don't know what the whole animal looked like. And that mm -hmm. is certainly the case for a group of mammals called the Gondwanatheres. So finally getting to what the Gondwanatheres are. This is a group of mammals that is, was first found in and seems to be entirely restricted to the, you know, the landmass of Gondwana. These mm -hmm. are animals known from Southern Hemisphere uh, continents. So uh, South America, some have been found um, in Africa, uh, maybe in Australia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have- And what am I looking at here? So you're looking at three teeth of Gondwanatheres. These are molar teeth of them. Uh, they're very weird compared to most Mesozoic mammals, which are generally kind of like pointy teeth, uh, something you'd see like a weasel or maybe some, you know, like shrews or something like that. Uh, we th a lot of the Mesozoic mammals are extremely small and we're probably insectivores. Uh, these look more like almost kind of like an elephant tooth, which have those really sort of squiggly, almost figure eight, uh, wear facets on them. Yeah, um, I see it. Kind of like a maze. Yeah. But for the past really like 40 years, this is all we had for Gondwana fears. So we know there's this weird toothed group of mammals that lived in the southern continents, but there just wasn't enough work in that part of the world. Uh, the, you know, the fossils were not good enough to really say anything else about them. Um, but that has recently changed. Uh, thanks to discoveries from this part of Madagascar. Uh, the first of which was announced a few years ago uh, in the form of this animal called uh, Vintana. So Vintana is the first uh, Gondwana theater known from a complete skull. And it's a very, very weird skull for a Mesozoic mammal. So if you look at like the typical Mesozoic mammals, something like Zalamdolestes here, which I'm showing in the, the bottom left, 
Uh, skull very much like a modern shrew and about the same size. So I want to... Vintan is actually a very huge by Mesozoic mammal standards. It would have been around the size of a badger. Uh, the Zalam Dalasti skull is not, not to scale. It's only a few centimeters long. Um, so Vintana is okay. a lot bigger than the rest. And also the shape of the skull is, is very strange. So it's not like a shrew or a mouse or something like that. Uh, if we look at the skull of Vintana compared with some other later mammals, things from the Cenozoic, uh, in overall shape, it's actually quite similar to sort of big South American rodents like the capybara there. Um, it also has, you can see those sort of like weird pointed uh, uh, projections coming down off of the skull. Like on so the sides? Like, yeah, so those kind yeah. of curved pointy bits coming down underneath. Yeah, what is that? Looks like, a, it reminds me of saber tooth. I know, I know it's not a tooth, but it looks kind of like a saber tooth from my yes. perspective. So those are, those are actually part of the cheeks. So those are what are called the zygomatic arches. And that really elongate uh, curved zygomatic arch is something that's actually very rarely seen in mammals. Uh, another example would be in the giant armadillos from the ice age, the glyptodonts. So if you look at glyptodon to the right there, it has the similar zygomatic arch. Um, right. So it's a really, it's a weird mosaic of features in Vintana and suggests that these animals were probably, you know, both glyptodon and capybara are plant eaters. Um, and that Vintan actually was a Mesozoic sort of plant-eating mammal, uh, not a little insectivore, like basically everything else we know from that era. Cool. Um, so, so really opening up our view of ecology and sort of different niches occupied by Mesozoic mammals. Um, but Vintana was found a few years ago and was only the skull. Uh, what has been described in the past month uh, expands our knowledge of the Gondwanatheres substantially greater. It's this animal called Adelotherium huai, um, also from uh, this latest Cretaceous of Madagascar. And it's known from a beautiful, complete skeleton. Um, so we've gone from only having like fragments of teeth of Gondwanatheres to basically knowing the entire anatomy of them uh, in just a few years, thanks to these yeah. Malagasy deposits. Um, what a lucky find. Yeah, uh, it was it, it was actually very much luck because when they collected, so David Krauss and his team who led this expedition to Madagascar in collaboration um, with uh, of their uh, colleagues from uh, Tannery, the capital of Madagascar, the scientists there, um, they found actually a lot of crocodile bones and they just collected a big jacket of crocodile bones and they didn't know this fossil was in there. And it was only years later when they were starting to prepare these crocodiles, did they find that there was actually a whole mammal skeleton in there. So I think that wow. like this fossil, I think was collected in 1999, um, but it's only coming out now. It took a while to first recognize oh. that it was there and then to actually, you know, describe it. Um, and That's the crazy. name, <laughs> yeah. And it is, this is the, the crazy beast. So Adelotherium uh, is coming from the Malagasy word for crazy, the ancient Greek word therium for beast, which is used in a lot of mammal, fossil mammal names. Um, and when you reconstruct the skeleton, as you can see here, uh, it is a very weird looking animal. Um, it is really unlike any other Mesozoic mammal. Uh, the proportions are more badger-like than most of these okay. little mouse or shrew shaped things that's exactly what i was thinking um, i don't know if it's just the the you know the artist's rendition of the fur and the coloring but it's very badger like to me yeah the uh the art of it definitely sort of leaned into making it you know badger like colors right specifically sort of like a honey badger or a grison or one of those other uh types of animals um but if you look at the skeleton uh the proportions are are very strange it has this uh, almost sort of like humped back to it with this with these very powerful lumbar vertebrae. Um, the spines on some of them, so like the vertebrae between the rib cage and the, the hips are even pointed anteriorly, which is an odd feature. Um, Does that mean pointed towards the back, like towards the uh, butt? Po pointed towards the front. So you can see ah, like okay. right behind the rib cage, all those neural spines, the things on the top of the, the vertebra are pointed sort of towards the skull. Um, gotcha. So suggesting actually that there was quite, quite powerful, like 
like tendons and muscular attachment in that part of the body. Um, the skull is also very weird. So the skull is filled with holes. Um, so most mammals, well, basically all mammals and uh, most vertebrates have uh, these holes in the skull called foramina um, through which, you know, blood vessels and, you know, nerves pass. Um, but Atelotherium has a lot more foramina than any other mammal. And indeed, in places that no other mammal has, like it has a hole coming out in the forehead, it has a hole coming out basically between the bones of the nose, on the side of the face. Uh, it is, it's deeply mysterious. Yeah. So just to put it in comparison, um, looking at humans, can, where would we have foramina in our skull? Like with are the temples, is that a foramina? So the, those are, that's a fossa. So, fossa. okay. Um, so it, when we think about the different, like different things in the skull that begin with F, there are a lot, uh, and the nomenclature <laughs> can be quite tricky. So, uh, a foramen is basically, it's a, it's a small hole in, in the bone. So it is, it's not blind ended. It, you know, transmits its way through a bone. So something like a blood vessel that goes through your skull, that would be going through a foramen. Um, the biggest foramen in the human skull is the, the foramen magnum, which in Latin just means, you know, big opening, uh, which is where our spinal column, it's at the back of the skull. It's where the spinal cord uh, goes into okay. the brain. Um, then you can have, you can also have a fenestra, which is Latin for window, which is basically a, a, a large opening, uh, like the, you know, the temporal fenestra is where the jaw muscles attach in vertebrates. Um, but then you can also have a fossa, which is just sort of like a, a low depression on a bone. So in humans, our brains have become so big, we don't really have a real temporal fenestra anymore. It's just reduced to a temporal fossa. Um, but we also have plutonium of other foramina as well. We have a foramen basically uh, for the nerves of our face that comes under the, the eye, the infraorbital foramen. Uh, there's lots of tiny foramina in the jaw um, that you know, bring blood to our lips and our tongue and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they're, they're in there. Okay. Okay. Good. To, I have a better idea now of, uh, yeah, what you mean now when you say foramina or foramen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no we problem. do already have some questions, but I, before we get to your questions, I want to make sure that Christian shares everything that he can about this crazy beast. So yeah, go ahead, Christian. I, I, yeah, I think I've, I've covered, uh, covered the basics of it. Um, right. it's, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's very unexpected that it would look like this. And I think that really speaks to the importance of, uh, studying, you know, these, uh, poorly known parts of the world in terms of the paleontological history. Right. Yeah. There's a lot left to find out there. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's, that's one very exciting thing about paleontology, right? It's still it's like the yeah. it's almost like space or um or the ocean right there are areas yes. unexplored there's yeah. always more to find and yeah. yeah especially as we start looking at some of these you know previously understudied areas i think we're just going to find tons and tons of new fossils and you know building capacity in these countries is going to be very important for that as well like it's one thing for you know, a team from the U.S. to go down there once every five years or so, and right. they've already found like so many things. But like having you know Malagasy scientists on the ground with yearly field work, uh, I think it's going to be incredible. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, that makes me really excited for the our future um, in a time of uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that is that uh, field work in most places is kind of on hiatus at the moment. Right. Um, but, you know, there's a ton of fossils still to be described just in museums just, already. Yeah, just sitting there hiding in crocodilian bones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so Alex Sci Channel, very cool name, Alex, um, says, Hi, Dr. Kimmerer. I was the kid that inquired you through email about Otodus. Otodus? Okay. And yeah. he said, thank you. Or they said, thank you. Uh, do you know which formation was the new Adelotherium found in? Yeah, so it's in the it's in the Majunga Basin, um, and I actually don't know what the geological group for that is. So 
in Madagascar, the uh, like the geology was was historically just like informal beds. Like in the Triassic group that I work in, it was just like Isolo one, Isolo two, Isolo three. Um, they don't weren't stratigraphically formalized, and so the in the Majunga Basin, there's what's the the Maverano group. Um, but I honestly don't know if they have formalized the formation group member uh, that you know stratigraphic councils are in charge of. So, sorry, c cannot answer that one. <laughs> it's a lot of very specific um, paleontology lingo thrown in there. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, the, it's not that you know we know nothing of the geology of these parts of the world, um, but it it takes a while to like really refine. Uh, the stratigraphy in particular. Mm -hmm. And so it, uh, in this part of Madagascar especially, and it actually in a lot of places in sub-Saharan Africa, there's not great outcrop. So ideally when you're, you know, do stratigraphic mapping of an area, you have sort of the classic, oh, here's like, here's some modern stuff on top. And then you can see it's a perfect cross section through deep time. So where these fossils are being found are actually in the, the background that I have set here. This is one of the sites in Madagascar where these things are coming from. So they're just like little exposures of sand in scrub in grassland. And maybe you get a little bit of topology in the hills in the back there so you can get an idea of what the stratigraphy is. But figuring out like real boundaries, figuring out things like unconformities or disconformities that stratigraphers use to separate formations and groups, uh, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So with such strong hind legs and base of the spine, could the crazy beast have been prone to rearing up on his hind two legs instead of all fours? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think, I think it is possible. Uh, so, I mean, the, both the, the hind limbs and the forelimbs on this thing are, are pretty massive. Um, the forelimbs do have, hold on a second, we can, I'll go back to the, go back to it. Um, um, so you can see on the forelimbs there, it has a pretty prominent olecranon process, which is on the, the tip of the ulna. So in, in the, if you look at the arm, there's kind of like a knob coming out at the end of the elbow. So that suggests pretty powerful muscular attachment. Um, and that's usually what you see in animals that are able to dig. And I think it's not unlikely that Adelotherium was, was digging, maybe digging up roots or, you know, uh, tubers and things like that as part of its diet. So it does the, the really powerful uh, zygoma um, and the, the teeth that look kind of like an elephant's on this thing suggest that they were, they were chewing very fibrous material. Um, so, you know, leaves, maybe even some, you know, parts of stems and then roots of plants. Um, I, that said, like, if you look at digging animals today with these sorts of proportions, um, you know, a lot of them are able to at least temporarily sort of like rear up. So I could see Adelotherium, you know, temp temporarily going tripodal to like grab a fruit off a bush or something. Um, but it d definitely would not have been a habitual biped. Mm -hmm. So and it could, yeah. Do we have any evidence to tell us, um, you know, how Adelotherium or crazy beast would have protected itself from predators? And to add to that question, let's put this into the, the dinosaur perspective. Were there yeah. dinosaurs around in the same area at the time of crazy beast? Yes, for sure. So in addition to like, like Majungasaurus, that really big one, um, mm -hmm. Adelotherium may be too small for to be really be much of a meal for Majungasaurus, um, but there are also so there are other small abelosauroids um, in this habitat. There's an animal called Mashikasaurus, uh, which was much smaller and actually had had very cool dentition. It had uh, the lower jaw teeth were kind of like curved outwards, um, and it's been suggested that was for catching fish because it has the it, without a picture here, it's it's hard to say, um, but imagine the, like the teeth are very like they're very hooked. Like imagine like very hooked teeth. Uh, okay. And so maybe for catching fish, but I'm sure it would also take in Adelotherium uh, if it wanted. 
Um, these Gondwana Thiers, looking like both Adelotherium and Ventana, uh, they don't appear to be armored. They don't have particularly, like, they don't have tusks or anything. Um, I doubt that they would really be able to, you know, throw down in a fight with a carnivorous dinosaur. Um, but what they probably were doing is just being, you know, fairly elusive. Like, they probably would have, if not, you know, they probably would have been digging you know, not living underground all the time, but they probably would have been in a den like an aardvark or a, like a warthog is today. So mm -hmm. I think if a predator was around, they would try to just take take cover more than anything else. A lot um, of mammals are lot like that today. Mesozo yeah, yeah. I think it's it's been it's a it's a pretty successful strategy for dealing with predators. <laughs> um, it's also possible that these animals were nocturnal. So a lot of Mesozoic mammals have been inferred as nocturnal. Uh, the Gondwana theories are so weird, it's, uh, it's difficult to say. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, if, if they were active when dinosaurs were asleep, that would also be sort of a helpful way to avoid predation. Right. All right, and Anne had a great question. Um, were humans around at the time? And I know that, you know, you said that Crazy Beast was around during the Mesozoic. So mm -hmm. humans were not around during the Mesozoic era, but can you remind us exactly like when during the Mesozoic was Adelotherium alive? Yes, this is in, in the latest Cretaceous. So this is getting into around between 70 and 65 million years ago. Um, so yeah, this is before any of the diversification of the modern mammal groups. Um, this is before the earliest primates and, you know, a full 60 million years before the earliest thing, even in the hominid lineage. Um, so definitely no humans. And Adelotherium, I should note, doesn't have any living relatives. So the Gondwana theories are, they are a totally extinct group. Um, they may have gone extinct even with the dinosaurs. So there's been some question whether certain fossils from the early age of mammals, the Cenozoic in Argentina are late surviving Gondwana theories. You know, some paleontologists have argued, no, they're just uh, weird marsupials. So that remains to be seen. Um, right. There is this huge radiation of, of different mammal groups in the Mesozoic that basically don't have any modern descendants. So there's, in addition to Gondwana theories, there's these groups called uh, multituberculates um, and triconodonts. So there is, increasingly, we are recognizing huge diversity in Mesozoic mammals. Uh, whereas historically they were thought to be, you know, quite rare and quite, quite basic based in how, how they lived. Like they were all tiny, they were all shrew-like. Um, and now we know that's, that's not the case. Uh, some that's of them right. got reasonably large and they were also more ecologically diverse. Mm -hmm. And I believe, was it our first or our second episode of Old News where you talked about a particularly large mammal that was living around that time? Um, yeah. If people want to learn more, maybe yes. we can reference Check it out. one of those. Uh, <laughs> so we have, we have bumped up the Mesozoic mammal size substantially from like mouse sized or rat sized at largest. And now we have at least, you know, badger to maybe small dog. That's still as big as they get, but you know, that's still an order of magnitude increase. Right. There are these animals like, yeah, Rapenomammus, which is one from China. Um, which was a large predatory mesozoic mammal. Um, these Gondwana theers, uh, and even some, yeah, there was the one that we were talking about from, I think from Western North America that is at least cat sized. So yeah, mm -hmm. there's, there's some big ones out there. Yeah. Okay, well, we are almost out of time, but I did want to ask you one more question. Um, why the name Crazy Beast? I mean, I know I keep like pushing this badger mm -hmm. thing, but badgers today, especially the honey badger, you know, that's like a meme, right? That they're kind of crazy. Honey badgers don't care. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. So is that why they got that name or it, does it have to do just with like, you know, the sheer luck of finding a full mammal skeleton? Like what's, what's behind the name? No, it's just because it's such a bizarre anatomy. Like it's, especially if you are a, a mesoic mammal specialist. When you look at the skull of this thing, it doesn't make any sense. Like it really looks like no other mammal we've ever seen. Um, even like the the holes in the skull are are not seen in any other mammals, and you have to actually go really far even outside of mammalian evolution before you get to something similar. 
So w when this animal was first being worked on, um, I was contacted uh, in reference to like whether there are any cynodonts, sort of the, the mammal ancestors that I specialize in, uh, that have anything similar. And there are, are some cynodonts with sort of weird foramina, uh, but nothing as extreme as this. So uh, that plus the, we didn't talk too much about the teeth of this thing. The teeth are very weird, even compared to the other Gondwana theers. Um, it's, they're bizarre and difficult actually to homologize or to say what cusp is what, what tooth is what compared to other mammals. So yeah, the more the researchers working on this started learning about the animal, the more they just like, this is, you know, this is totally bizarre. So yeah. it's, a, it's a crazy looking critter is all it is. <laughs> and uh, you did mention that there was a foramina, like a hole in the skull right in the center, right? So yeah. bear with me here. Is it possible that this is actually a unicorn, like a unicorn badger? <laughs> Right. Uh, that would that would be wonderful uh, if it existed, <laughs> but alas, alas, it is not. So foramina um, never serve as uh, basically as as the basis for a horn or something like that. So they indicate that a basically a channel is going through the bone for blood or a gland or nerves or something like that. Gotcha. Um, there are a lot of fossil mammals with horns, some of them with horns that detach from the skull when they die, um, like, like deer do today. Uh, but there's always a, a horn base for them. Uh, and it depends on what the horn is made of, whether it's like an antler or a true horn or an ossicone. These are all different types of horns that mammals have. But there's always some kind of base. Even in something like a rhinoceros, where the horn is just made up of keratin, just like, you know, the, basically hair or fingernail. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually like a roughened patch on the skull underneath the horn. So nothing just like a foramen there. Uh, I will note there are a lot of true unicorns in the mammal fossil record. So there are plenty of weird extinct mammals that had a single horn coming out of the forehead. Um, my favorite of which is actually there's a unicorn pig that used to live in Africa and Asia going around five to ten million years ago, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm called Cubanicoris. So it was a giant pig, maybe, you know, over 700 pounds in weight. Uh, and it, yeah, just the, the males at least had a, a horn just sticking right out of the forehead. That's crazy. Yeah. But also I'm glad that you are not like completely crushing my dreams, but yes, unicorn mammals don't exist. Yeah, no, there, there, were, there were some that were real. That's, that's super cool. We'll have to, maybe there'll be some, uh, some old news about a unicorn species sometime next fall. Um, and this was the only fossil of Adelotherium, correct? Yeah. So mesoic mammal fossils are super rare. And most of these ones, especially from the Southern Hemisphere, are known from single specimens. So hopefully in the future, as more work in these deposits are done, we'll find more, maybe learn what those foramina are for, maybe learn more about what the skeleton of Ventana looked like, um, and help to put these animals better sort of in their ecosystem, understand their paleobiology. Uh, but for now, we're just super happy that we, you know, we even have this one. Because uh, yeah. it really is, it's like a Rosetta Stone for understanding Gondwana theorians uh, yeah. as a group. Um, I also did want to notice, note, I just checked, and it is the Maverano formation. So it was originally uh, the informal Maverano group, which is what I, I was talking about earlier. Um, but I guess the, the recent work has allowed it to become formalized as a formation. Awesome. Um, and Alex had also pointed that out in the chat. Forgot to okay. mention it. Good. So yeah, good job, both of you guys doing your research. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, and Old News is going to be taking a break over the summer because even if paleontologists can't do field work right now, as you know by now, there's plenty of research to be done. And so, yeah, we will be returning in the fall, should return in August, if not September. If you want to find out and get alerts for Old News episodes, you can subscribe 
by emailing us at outreach at naturalsciences.org. I will type that into the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining us. And thank you, Christian, for bringing your expertise to us. Oh, it was my um, pleasure. Always happy <laughs> to talk about these things. Yeah, I know. This is, this is one of my favorite programs. <laughs> <laughs> shucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shucks. All right. Well, everybody have a great summer and we hope to see you in the fall. And yes. that's a yeah, wrap on spring old news. Yeah, have, have a great day, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Stay safe out there. <laughs> Love it. Bye.